welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour with our very precious guest today, Christy Luna, who goes by Luna. I hope that you can listen to this while walking or cooking or having a cup of tea, but I hope you're in a mentally stable place because it's a lot. When Chrissy tells her story of how she deconstructed her religious trauma and the events of her life that took place to get her to a place where she was ready to deconstruct her religious trauma, it's an intense story. I, I'll say I was on the edge of my seat and my heart broke right there in the interview for her and with her. I think it's something we need to talk about. I think the Christian nationalist agenda, as well as many other religions, and dare I say it, spiritual traditions, from Buddhism to yoga, it is rampant out there. And the underpinnings of colonialism, patriarchy, white supremacy, are strong. They have a hold on us. It is the ocean that we swim in here, at least in the United States. Maybe other countries have a little better awareness than we do. And I think this is a tough one to hear, but so needed. We need to bring things out of the darkness and shine light onto them and say, here's what it is. And I think when you hear Chrissy Luna's story, you'll agree. But we need to shine a light on this and really take it seriously and deconstruct it and find a new way forward, which Chrissy has done. That's the beauty is that she did the work. She came out the other side. She doesn't have the anger and the resentment and the blame and shame. She has freedom. Isn't that what we want? We want freedom. When we've come through trauma, it's not enough to just say, well, I'm going to forgive that person, which is nice. Don't get me wrong. But to feel liberated from the suffering, that's amazing. So I hope you enjoy this episode. It's a very serious discussion about religion, dogma, yoga, yoga therapy, and I think it will give you hope in the end. And I actually think it will make you very proud of yoga therapy because this is the tool that Chrissy was able to use to heal herself. And what a wonderful tool it is. Okay, today I'm going to do a very, very surprising best of humanity segment. Are you ready for this? My best of humanity, and I know you're going to push back on this, but don't knock it till you try it, is TikTok. Yes, we're being spied on. Yes, they're tracking us. Yes, they're going to sell us things. I, I'm not denying any of that, and it's probably horrible. However, there are people finally being seen and heard for a variety of things that they've been alone with their whole lives, sharing their stories, helping others realize like, whoa, I think I have that too. I'm not alone. I personally, for mental health issues, I love hearing people's experience. And I'm on the positive side of TikTok. There's probably some dark, dark side of it too. But my logarithm brings me so much goodness, so much authenticity, so much humility, so much goodness, so much hope every single day. And you can build your own logarithm. Just don't look at the nasty stuff and only stay on the side of humanity and helping one another, sharing stories, talking about things like religious trauma. It's a really beautiful place. And I'll say the first time I got on, I got kind of distracted by a bunch of stuff and I, I watched certain videos too long or whatever. And it took me to a not so great place. So I got off, erased my profile, started over with a new one and was very diligent about the types of things I wanted to see with likes, comments, and which videos I stay on for how long. And I have this beautiful logarithm of mental health issues 
that makes me feel connected to humanity and it helps me have hope for the future. Especially like Luna said, this new generation of Gen Zers on platforms like TikTok, it's an amazing, amazing thing that we're seeing. So whether you like it or not, we can agree to disagree, but it's really giving me hope for the future of humanity. All right. If you have something that you think is making a difference for humanity, let me know. I'd love to hear it. I introduce you to Luna. Sit down, enjoy, and give yourself some space. Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. My name is Amy Wheeler, and I'm your host. We are so happy to tell you all that's happening in the world of yoga therapy. And we love to find guests from all over the world so that we can share and learn and grow together. Please nourish yourself, take time for yourself, and really relax into listening to the podcast. Today, I would like to welcome my colleague and friend, Chrissy Luna, who prefers to go by Luna. And and we both have a candle that we're going to light, I hope. And I think the reason we're starting with this candle, let's just look at the light for a minute here, Luna, is because what we're gonna talk about today involves a lot of suffering. It's a delicate topic. It probably deserves a trigger warning. I'm, I'm already feeling a little triggered just in our pre-conversation. Even as we burn off the mala and the difficulties and the suffering, I think remembering that each one of us has a light within that's not able to be destroyed. It's, it's there. And I think you are proof that that internal light cannot be destroyed. Absolutely. Thanks for coming today and discussing such a delicate topic. Thank you for having me and be preparing for this, this talk that we're having now. I, that's exactly what I meditated on was that I am the light. The light is in me and it's not extinguished. It's always going to be a flame. Mm. Okay. Well, where do we even begin? I think I'll just introduce the topic and then let you tell us the definition. And that is RTS, which I think is religious trauma syndrome. Yes. yes. It is a phrase that was coined by Dr. Marlene Winnell, if I'm not mistaken her name. It's kind of a newer diagnosis. It's not in the DSM-5. I think that the past several years, there's become a movement, a deconstruction movement, the fundamental religious indoctrination that a lot of people have endured and how that's impacted their lives negatively. So religious trauma is so hard to define because everyone has a different experience with their trauma, sexual abuse, indoctrination, gaslighting. I mean, there's so many things that kind of go into it. So I think the best way for me to kind of lay out what religious trauma can look like is just to share my story. Yeah. And and I just want to say, this could be any religion, really. You're going to share your story, but for our listeners, they're going to maybe have some aha moments, even though they had a different religion than you, or even spiritual tradition. There's a lot of spiritual cults taking advantage of people too. Yeah, you're right. It is any religion, but it's really the fundamental religion, the fundamentalism where it's black or white, this or that, yes or no, good or bad. That is the damage that I've seen and have experienced and that shaped me in a way that I was unprepared and ill-equipped to become a healthy adult, a healthy, thriving adult. And I grew up in an evangelical family. We went to church every Sunday. I went to um, youth group every Wednesday night. I did all the activities. But I was a rebellious kid. 
I was always rebellious, but I still knew where I was in the place of the hierarchy, I guess, or where I knew my place is what I'm trying to say. I, mean, I always knew my place. Women, girls were raised to be subservient to men, to their fathers, to church leaders that were always men. And so for me, I think, well, for anybody familiar with Christianity, there's a concept of original sin mm. that you were born bad, inherently bad. You were born just disgraceful. And the only thing that will save you is this external entity. And so when you're told that you grow up thinking you'll never be enough because you're told you aren't enough without Jesus, without God, you're not enough. And so that made me feel always like I wasn't enough. But my, my first real interaction or aha moment with my religious trauma was when I was 15 years old. I got pregnant at 15 and I was with a, a friend. We were at a football game. It was in high school and we went to someone's house and I was given alcohol by a 23 year old man. Mm. I was 15 and I got pregnant that interaction. I got pregnant and I was so scared because we were so heavily involved in the church. My father was an elder at the church that we were at. And I was just so scared to know what to do. And I confided in a friend at school and this friend was also religious, but he was Catholic. And so this friend violated my privacy and he told his priest that I was pregnant and the priest told the pastor of my church that I was pregnant. And that pastor called my parents and told them I was pregnant. And my parents called me into the room going, we know you're pregnant. And so that's how my parents found out that I was a 15 year old pregnant girl. So that invasion of privacy was really devastating because it left me no choice in how I was gonna respond to my situation. I have a baby, obviously, and I have a beautiful daughter and I have a beautiful son. I ended up marrying the man who raped me. And it was because I felt pressured to, I felt like, okay, you're pregnant and that's the thing to do because you're a Christian and you get pregnant, you get married and you start a family. So I married a man that I had no emotional love for at all. And I spent my the next 14 years married to this person who was physically abusive, emotionally abusive to me and my children. And I was controlled and it's not treated kindly. I mean, that's basically, it wasn't treated very kindly. There were many times I tried to leave him. In fact, I counted, there were six times in that 14 years that I tried to leave this person. And every time I would come back because he would throw the Bible at me. He would say, God hates divorce and you'd be a terrible mother if you leave us. And I would just be so scared. I was going to go to hell or I was not fulfilling my, my motherly duties. And I didn't want to be a bad mother. I did go to my parents. I remember going to my parents one time, just one time because they threw me right back over there. Mm -hmm. And my father just said, we need to get used to marital counseling. So I went to marital counseling and it was, me, a very young girl, a woman, this man, eight years, nine years older than me, in a room with two other grown men. I was the only woman. I was the only female in the room. And I felt very attacked. I felt cornered. And they were basically telling me that I needed to forgive him for the abuse and that, well, look at him. He's sorry. You know, he's, he loves the Lord. He's doing the best that he can. And he just got angry. And my ex-husband sitting there next to me with his Bible open and, and, you know, yep, yep. So these were church elders that you were getting marital counseling from? Yes, church elders. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I remember saying, like, what about what he's doing to me, you know? And 
at that point, their answer was just like, you know, in the Lord's eyes, it's sinful to divorce and, you know, you need to make this work. And so I kind of gave up at that point. I stopped telling my parents about the abuse. I just lived with it for 14 years. And I would just pray that something would happen that would rescue me really from that whole situation. So after 14 years, the last straw that helped me finally leave was when he pulled a knife on me. He chased me around the house with a knife and I eventually ran out and he ended up checking himself into the hospital on his own accord, which I was happy about because he was gone. And the church that we were at, the church that I taught kindergarten Sunday school at, the church that I went to every single Sunday, they supported him. They helped him. They helped him get into like some assisted living because I didn't want him in the home anymore. So they set him up for support. And they only called me once to say like, what did I do? They never once called to see if I needed some groceries or just the kids were still with you. I assume my my kids were with me. And while my ex-husband was in the hospital, he cut off his paycheck. So almost immediately I stopped getting his paychecks and it was just me. I was instantly a single mother instantly with no help. I was so disappointed in the church for the way they handled that. I never, ever got a call and we are members of that church. So I think at that point I was like kind of done and I just stopped going. So my journey to deconstructing my religious beliefs didn't even start until like a few years ago. So 10, 15 years went by struggling, getting anxiety, always having anxiety always being an overachiever because I was never good enough, always going, going, going and pushing myself because I was trying to prove that I was enough. At that Mm -hmm. point, were you, were you still believing in Jesus and the tenets of the church or (laughs) kind of said, well, this has not served me. I'm, I'm going to switch directions. I still believed it. Mm. I still believed it, but I was like, I was just ignoring it. I was starting yoga at that time. Like, so once we split up, I was already going to like a yoga class, but I was like, this is just for physical fitness. (laughs) I'm not doing any of the religious stuff, the none of the spiritual stuff, because I knew in my, in my head, in my brain that it was wrong because the church told me it was wrong. And I can remember one yoga class in particular, I was feeling great, you know, yoga blissed out afterwards, getting my shoes on and having this feeling of dread that I was going to hell. And I never even realized that that fear was so ingrained in me until like that moment and questioning like, Oh my God, am I going to go to hell for this for going to yoga? (laughs) Yeah. Like am I a terrible person? And I just kind of put it out of my mind, but it was there. I just ignored it. It wasn't until I started working on myself for my anxiety, thinking it was just my trauma from being physically abused for 14 years, the sexual trauma. I I thought I was just unraveling that. But as I started to unravel that ball of yarn, you know, with my therapist, I was like, you know, there's more to this. Like I felt, I felt like I was getting somewhere with resolving my trauma, but there was still something that hmm, I couldn't place it. Cause I was still like nervous all the time. I was still not confident in, in myself. And I realized the reason why I stay for so long in that marriage and women, uh, this isn't for every woman. Every woman have different reasons for staying in those abusive relationships. It's really hard to put yourself in that situation unless you're in it. But for me, what kept me there was religious indoctrination. Mm. the indoctrination that told me that I had to stay with an abusive person despite what was going on on around me, despite what was happening to me and my kids. I had to stay in that, that relationship because the Bible said so. And because church elders said so, because men said so. And that is when my healing really shifted. You know, it's, just occurring to me, I wrote this 
little word down. It's anti-yoga. Which hundred percent. Yoga is about going inward and connecting deeply to yourself and knowing who you are and creating the life that you can sustain based on you, your values, your beliefs, your inner knowing. Mm-hmm. And what I hear you describing is the opposite. Don't trust yourself. God forbid you go inward. Don't regulate your nervous system. <laughs> no. and just believe what these old white dudes probably, yes. sorry, you know, what they're telling you, <laughs> you don't go to hell, which is, I mean, I'm the daughter of a Christian minister. I don't know if you know that. I did. <laughs> Literally what my dad says is like heaven and hell were man-made concepts that are very recent. Absolutely. Control people. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't believe in hell anymore. So that fear is completely gone. I have no fear of hell at all. It is exactly the opposite of yoga because I think that's why yoga healed me. That's, I don't know what other tools or modality could do what yoga therapy did for me in deconstructing my religious trauma and my indoctrination and being judgmental with others because you you learn to be judgmental because it's us versus them. And so you're always pointing the finger. And so you're always judging yourself. Yeah. How was that when you realized that there's this yoga philosophy thing that's telling you to go inward and you're inherently good. There isn't original sin. Like you are the light. Mm-hmm. Like how what, was that like mind blowing to hear somebody say that at first? It was more mind blowing when I felt it. Mm. When I felt it, which and felt like what? Freedom. One word: freedom. In, like embodied freedom, like in your cells, or like freedom from anxiety, or what do you mean by that? I think all of it, freedom from the confines of the construct of religion. My sense of self was restored. Mm. I felt like I discovered that inner light in me. I discovered that power in me that was not external and that it's always there. My, My confidence is like through the roof now because I believe in myself for the first time. I believe in myself. And like with fundamentalism, fundamental Christianity in particular, it's this either or of healthy self-esteem or pride and ego. And you can't have self-esteem. It all that glory, all that work that you do, all that glory goes to God or it goes to Jesus. That wasn't you at all. That none of it was you. That was him. And I accentuate him because they gender God. Yeah. As I am. Was there any part of you? I'm going totally off script here. <laughs> but I, I'm fascinated by this because I think, you know, some of us have even experienced this same dogma in yoga, strangely. Was there any part of you that was worried that you were switching one thing you needed to deconstruct for another? Like, oh gosh, what if I get into this yoga thing and I end up in a cult and then I have to deconstruct that? Was there any fear or or not really? Not really, because I know that yoga and Hinduism are interconnected in a way, but they're not the same thing at all. Hearing like my mentor, my mentor talk about the history of yoga and the philosophy of of yoga and how yoga doesn't require you to believe in a God in the Sankhya philosophy, you know, it's, it's the light Purusha is inner light and light could be God for some, but for others, it's just, it's just the light and the power within you. It doesn't have to be necessarily linked to a God or a goddess or Jesus. It can, it certainly can. But I didn't have that fear because I already had my guards up. Mm. My guard, and, I, and I wasn't going to go that, down that road. And once I started learning more yoga philosophy, I was like, oh my gosh, I felt safe. It felt very safe to study because I feel like anybody, like, like somebody practicing Buddhism, somebody who practiced Judaism, like they can all practice yoga. And I think it will make them a better person. Buddhist, the better mm-hmm. Christian, if they, if they practice. Yoga. That's what Deska Char says, you know, and I, 
think what I also just heard you say, you know, shout out to your mentor, Priya, Priya. <laughs> is you had a trusting relationship with her. Yeah. And I think that, so that's a really good point that you're saying, because I think because I trusted Priya, there could be situations, especially if you're not with a skilled teacher, if you're not working with a skilled teacher who is trauma informed, number one, and also isn't spiritually bypassing Mm -hmm. religious trauma and spiritual abuse. It's happened in the yoga world too, as, as you know. And when I work with people, that's, that's one of the first things I share. I want them to know that there's been harm done in yoga and that, and what to look out for. Cause there's so much spiritual bypassing in the yoga community and in the, the wellness circle altogether. That's exactly what for me, religious fundamentalism did was spiritually bypassed everything. Mm. So yes, working with a skilled teacher and trusting them is so, so very important. Yeah. So we're going to talk about your offerings at the end, but <laughs> it seems to me that as you help people overcome their religious trauma, it really wouldn't matter which religion or which spiritual path that they were traumatized on, that the programs that you are offering, there's some common themes or common threads that usually run through patriarchy, nationalism, dogma, don't believe yourself, don't trust yourself. Decolonization too. Yes. Those are all things that are kind of across the board with religious trauma and spiritual abuse in in general. Yes. I do work with other, I mean, not just ex evangelicals, which is the cute term that they they coin ex evangelicals, but I think that's more, the common thread is fear because when we leave that comfort of that church where we have so much support, Mm. it is so tight knit. You have friends, you have community and you have family and you leave that because you finally recognize the harm it's causing you and you're scared. And so I first work on soothing that part of them. Like, okay, what's going on right now is they're afraid, they're angry, and they're confused. So first kind of stabilizing the nervous system, teaching them that your gut reaction or whenever you have, when you're questioning things, they were told that that's the devil. We're taught not to trust that because it's not from God. But when they learn about their nervous system, like it's just nervous system response. It's an emotion. It's okay. It's output. (laughs) It's output. That brings a lot of comfort because like I said, that fear is real, is just ingrained in us. And I think with fundamental religion, that's the tool that they use to keep you. And they they want to keep you afraid of going out in the world. Mm -hmm. They want to keep us afraid of learning more and questioning because they don't want to lose us. Yeah. Yeah. So I know one of the major tools that has helped you is like yoga nidra and specifically the limb called pratyahara, where you're learning to take your senses and your mind inward. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. My yoga nidra practice, because religion, fundamental religion left me so controlling it made me a very controlling person because if I'm not good enough, I want to make damn sure that I do this the best that I can and, and over striving years and years of over striving. I was just like a tensed up ball of muscle, just so tense all the time in my face and my neck. And it wasn't until I, I started my yoga ninja practice that I could teach my body. My body learned that it was, it's okay to relax, that it was safe. And every single day doing that rest practice is, is, was so necessary for me because it became more as a way of life, just a way of, of non-being. It's the opposite of being and doing. Mm-hmm. It's a yoga nidra. My teacher, my yoga nidra teacher calls it a 
as a practice of subtraction. Mm, I love that. Yes. The more you're doing in yoga nidra, the, the less effective it is, the less effective it is. And then my Pratyahara practice, yes, actually helped me to get out of my head all the time and ground in my body, really ground in my body. My, my self-study was also huge in my recovery, recognizing my patterns and saying, oh, where did that come from? And then I could say, oh, that came from when I was told this. And then being like compassionate with myself and not being angry and frustrated that they kind of quote unquote did this to me, but that it's there. And I think that having that loving kindness to myself for the very first time really helped me to let go and trust, trust myself, build trust in myself. So I I just noticed something that you reframed, which was, it, it sounded to me like, you chose not to blame them. You chose to focus on creating more resilience and comfort within yourself. That was your focus. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll be honest because in the beginning, I sure did blame my parents. I was so mad at them. I was really, really mad that I wasn't protected and I wasn't in like, that's what your parents are supposed to do. They're supposed to protect you. And I felt really, really angry. And I let that go. I had to let that go because they were indoctrinated too. Do they get that? No, okay. no, they don't. See that that's a whole nother piece. Like, can you move forward with your life? Even if the people who have hurt you don't understand what they've done, like that's amazing work that you've done. Cause don't most of us want a sense of closure and understanding. And I want to be seen and heard for my pain. It was something that you had said, Amy, to us in in class once. You said, do you want to be right or do you want to be in a relationship? And I repeat that all the time to people, to myself. And that was the question I asked. Do I want to be right? Because I know I'm right. (laughs) I'm just telling you, you're right. (laughs) I'm right. (laughs) They don't have to know I'm right. And I love them. I love my parents, despite they have flaws. And I'm lucky in that I don't have parents that are pushing the religion down my throat. And there's a lot of us that do leave that they sever ties with their family because their family cannot accept that they chose a different path. And I am so lucky that my parents haven't done that to me. So it's just like, we agree to disagree in a way. We just don't bring up those topics. And the trade-off is that I have a superficial relationship with my parents and that's okay. I still love them. And yeah, it's, it's hard. I'm like kind of in shock over here. Like it, it's really hard. I don't know very many people that have been able to find acceptance for their parents and, and some amount of compassion and move forward because you want to build the life you want and you don't want to be blocked by the judgment of them. Yes. I do have trepidation still about like, I don't share my work with my parents. Mm -hmm. I I don't, I don't share a lot. And I know that there's going to be a time where we have a discussion and I, and I know that's, that's coming, but I think what's helped me give them grace is my own work on decolonization because they're indoctrinated because their parents were indoctrinated and so on and so on. And the Spaniards that came and indoctrinated and pushed Christianity on my indigenous ancestors, we lost our spirituality. We lost our native language. Mm -hmm. It's not Spanish. We all lost all of our culture. I'll just say we lost it all. And that colonization is one of the, like you can't talk about religious trauma without talking about white supremacy and colonization because they're the ones that brought it in so that they can control the indigenous population. They wanted to control them. And it wasn't about wanting to save their souls. 
I wasn't about that at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's deep. I mean, it, to me, you just, you zoomed from your personal suffering all the way out to horrific worldwide events that have been happening for thousands of years. And, and you're part of that suffering, mm-hmm. but somehow, and I think this comes from Krista Neff's work on self-compassion, when you realize that you're not alone other people have also suffered this way by no fault of their own. We're in this together and we can heal. That's powerful. And I think that's what your programs that you're starting will do. Don't you? I hope so. I really, I mean, that's my goal. I worked really hard on creating something that will alleviate their suffering from the get go. And then the harder, deeper work, is once you kind of alleviate, alleviated the initial suffering, you, you've you got tools to help you with your anxiety or your depression or whatever it is, religious trauma left you. The next step is finding that sense of yourself. Like the emotional struggles, those are real. But like being in the world, and I have one client who said, I'm a really nice person. I'm really sweet. I do anything for anybody. But as soon as I left, I don't, I don't know if that's me. Maybe I'm an asshole. I don't know. I, I don't know who I am. And she really struggled with that. She didn't know her, her personality was even hers. Mm. That is terrifying. That's wow. really terrifying. People, if you don't know if it's you or something that somebody programmed in you, I mean, just think about that for a second. How I'm just taking it in. Like, okay, I've seen how women especially have acted. I've modeled my behavior after that. There's all these rules around us that this is how a good woman or a good girl should act. I step into that and play that role. And when I step out and try to connect with myself, there's no one home. Right. Right. Oh, blank canvas. Yikes. Yeah. Anti-yoga. <laughs> Anti-yoga. Anti. And that's why I, I am convinced that yoga therapy is the antidote. Mm-hmm. It's the antidote to finding yourself, to learning how to be in the world again from a totally different perspective, getting involved in, in social justice and things that were more, you know, no, no in, you know, in church, getting involved in climate change, you know, caring about things that fundamentalist religion doesn't care about. And for some people, it's exciting because they get to try new things. But for a lot of other people, a lot of us, it's, it's really terrifying and they, we don't know what to do. We don't know what our next steps are. So that's kind of my second program. So the first program is geared more for alleviating the immediate suffering. And the second program is more for developing and getting to know and igniting that light within them. It's already there. It's not igniting it. It's more like uncovering it, helping them to uncover it. Yeah. You know, I've known you for a few years now and I didn't know any of this. I, I, you had loosely mentioned that you have had religious trauma and that that's kind of where you wanted one of your main focuses of your yoga therapy work to be, but Wow, I'm just kind of blown away by your story and your willingness to face this so honestly. Like, wow. I, I'm it's I'm yoga. Talking. That's why I can do this stuff now. It's just it's all been scared. Are you scared? I mean Am I scared? I'm terrified for you to <laughs> not because anything bad is gonna happen, but because how scary must it be to reconstruct your lens and your life and your dreams and your beliefs and your values. Like, whew. Yeah. Yeah. It is scary. I'm not, I'm not going to say it's not, but I, I do want to say this, that I'm not here to take anyone's joy away. If you find joy and comfort in religion and you have a wonderful, pleasant experience, that's great. That's wonderful. I'm so happy for you, but not everyone has that same experience. And so some of the fear I like to say trepidation because I'm not scared, but 
some of that is because I'm going to offend people. I know I'm offending people. I was talking to my cousin the other day. I love her dearly. And she was recommending my services to a friend of hers. And she was on my website. And she's like, what's up with that religious trauma thing? You know, what's going on there? And she listened with an open heart. But like, I'm going to have those conversations with people because the, the knee-jerk reaction is like, oh, are you an atheist? What? Are you, are you this? Are you that? And it's not that. It's not that at all. If we would just follow the teachings of Jesus. <laughs> and then I always say that like... Yeah, <laughs> that That's would solve the problem. Uh-huh. <laughs> we just did what Jesus asked. It, it would all be good now, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would be so good, but yeah. I'm, unfortunately, that's not the case. I think what you're offering is so needed in the world. I think yoga is a perfect modality, and I, I think this is why so many recovering religious and spiritual people end up in yoga because they're looking to restructure Mm -hmm. after not having a great experience. Yes. And I think we kind of go in two camps, either you're so disillusioned that you just don't want to believe in God anymore. You don't want to believe in God. Or the other camp is I miss my Jesus. Like they miss it. They miss their spirituality. They miss that. They miss all that. And yoga therapy appeals to both. Right. Both. Absolutely. So let's talk about this upcoming program that you have. So People excited. who are watching on YouTube <laughs> are looking at ChrissyLuna.com. So www.C-R-I-S-S-Y-L-U-N-A, like the moon, dot com. And you have a six week online yoga therapy group program to support you on your journey towards religious and spiritual trauma recovery. Tell us about this program that you've developed. Yes. This program it's the step one or the level one. This is the program that is designed to help soothe the anxiety, the insomnia, the depression, all of those emotional struggles that come. You can click on that. Yeah come in with recovering from religious traumas. So we meet for six weeks and I did it on Sunday mornings to fill in that. that I love gap. that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, That's amazing to have a Sunday morning <laughs> trauma recovery class. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sunday morning is our full class where we do our check-in, we build community. I really want to create a space where they have that support that they're missing so much from church. That's um, an hour on Sunday mornings. And then we meet Wednesday evenings, which is a popular Bible study time, day and time, Wednesday evenings. And that is kind of a check-in, q and I'll do a lot of yoga nidra in those Wednesday nights. You get to have two times per week of all of this trauma recovery stuff happening. Let's see, what else do you have? You get a private with me first. So you will meet with me. We'll talk through what religious trauma looks like for you. There is an application process in the beginning. So you'll apply and then reach out to you for a one-on-one so we can discuss if this is the right program for you. And um, yeah, very small group setting. And it's going to be hopefully a time of connection and healing. I am so excited for you. You know, we, we talked about that. Traditionally, there would be a lag time between recording this and then when the podcast comes out, but I'm going to like move you up in the queue because this thing needs to get out there before you start in a few weeks. Yes. It starts in spring. I don't have the dates finalized yet, but they will be finalized on my website very, very soon. And yeah, it's going to be amazing. And what I love about you choosing these clients and niche, if you will, is you too are going to receive continued healing over time by creating this community. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you needed. Yes, exactly. It's something that I, I didn't have deconstructing. And I mean, I'm in a couple of Facebook groups that are really actually very helpful, but you know, having that support and just knowing that camaraderie of knowing that you're not in it alone 
is so, so helpful. And everybody has a different story to share. Everybody has their own version of religious trauma and they just want to uncover the truth, the truth within themselves. Could somebody join if, if they were still unable to deconstruct? So they, they were listening to this and they're like, I might have that. Could they come to discover or is this for people who've kind of realized like, uh, I, I had to get out and I'm, it's time to heal? Um, I think that have to be decided in the interview. And I don't want to say yes or no right away. Like, no, they can't come. But I would be a little nervous that they might be triggered mm-hmm. by some of the discussion. I don't want, the, if they're not ready, if you, that's the thing, they have to be ready. They've already left. Yeah. If they're still deciding if it's the right, I'm not sure, maybe then let's have, a, let's have a discussion. Maybe you are, you might, you know, just don't realize it yet. We could do privates with you. Yeah, absolutely. Private. Exploration. Uh-huh. Yes. And then maybe next step would be doing the group program if they felt ready. Yeah. Yes. So are there any last words of wisdom that you'd like to share with us? Uh, Let's see. I think that you mentioned that somebody listening might wonder, "Mm, I wonder if I do have this. I think there might be a lot of that. I think there might be a lot of people who have tendencies and don't realize where where they stem from. It might not be like concrete for them or pressing, Mm. you know, like they, they might not realize it, but like say someone who's struggling with anxiety, for example, and it's because they just keep doing, 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 and not knowing why they don't feel like they have to keep striving. And sometimes you work with a therapist and, like I had, I had to discover it was my trauma, my religious trauma. We were just working on me not feeling, you know, good enough. Like where did that, where did that come from? So I think words of wisdom would be to listen to this with an open mind and it may not be applicable to you, but if you feel like it is, then there is so much hope through yoga therapy there to rediscover and reconnect with that that essential being within you that was taken from you at birth, literally taken from you at birth. There is hope and there is a way to become whole again. Which is such good news because I can imagine leaving everything you've ever known, wondering if there's a lifeline out there. Like that has to be terrifying. Yes. Not a lot of people know about religious trauma. And I think a lot of people dismiss it because if you weren't like, you know, sexually abused by a Catholic priest, and that's what we think of when we think of religious trauma, which absolutely is. But I'm kind of speaking more about the indoctrination that changes who you are into being an obedient human being that just says yes when they're told to. That's so harmful. It is so harmful to take away somebody's critical thinking. I don't know if you know this about me, Luna, but I love TikTok for this reason. I see people talking about their religious indoctrination and trauma all the time. For them, it's the first time they've been heard and seen for it. And it's the first time they're connecting with other people like, mm-hmm. whoa, this is a thing. Yeah. I love Gen Z. I, they're like the most amazing generation because... I'm Gen X, you know, we're the slackers. We didn't do anything, you know, we just <laughs> our own life. but like, they're, they're not putting up with the shit. They're not putting up with it. And I think Gen, the Gen Z has really started the deconstruction movement. And I'm just so happy that they did because it, like you said, connecting with other people, hearing other stories helps you realize that you're not alone. And collective suffering is so much easier than individual suffering. It's how we heal. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) Well, I feel lighter now than I did at the beginning. I was a little triggered when we started this thinking, Mm. like just having empathy for your situation and your story. I, I hope this is going to be a positive experience to speak your truth and be heard 
And I just want to say, if we get done with this interview and you have regrets or you think, oh God, I don't want that out there. No problem. Thank you. Well, I don't, we'll think, I'll, I don't think I'll do that, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you know, at any time, two years from now, you're like, I don't want that out here anymore. No problem. Okay. And I just feel so grateful that you're willing to be so open and vulnerable to help other people. That is the only reason why I allow myself to be vulnerable is because I know it will help other people. That's my goal really is just to help people find their truth and shed all of that guilt, fear, and shame that has been taught to them from birth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We didn't even talk about purity culture, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll come back because <laughs> I want to talk about purity culture. <laughs> That's a good one. We definitely need All right. To so maybe, maybe we'll do round two with you in a few months, but thank you so much, Luna. Thank you yeah. for having me. Thank you. It was an honor. What I heard Chrissy talk about today is that there's almost like three stages of healing. Stage one is to kind of pacify and soothe the immediate painful symptoms in our bodies and in our minds. Stage two is really maybe helping people choose the tools out of the yoga and yoga therapy toolbox and yoga nidra toolbox that will help us self-regulate and get our nervous systems and our minds back into balance and have the self-awareness to realize when we're going off track and, okay, how do I pull myself back? And then the third step is that ability to reconstruct who am I? Why am I here? What are my values? What are my beliefs? To take that blank slate that, that Chrissy talks about and to paint on it and to design the life and the liberation that most of us want for ourselves. And I love this because it's right in alignment with Sankhya and Ayurveda and yoga philosophy that we pacify and soothe before we go in and try to figure out the root cause and how to solve that root cause. I am so proud to have Luna in our Optimal State Yoga Therapy program, very close to graduation, and already offering this beautiful, beautiful gift to the world. So thank you, Luna, for showing up so authentically, so honestly, so beautifully. And thank you for holding Luna as she spoke her truth and brought this message forward to us. Let's all say a little prayer and give support to her as she moves into her dharma and starts making a big difference in the world. She will need our love and support. Please don't forget to sign up for our newsletter mailing list, where we give you a free gift every single week. It's usually something that the guest has been talking about, like a book chapter, or an article, or an infographic. Check out the show notes for that. Thank you for listening today. Don't forget, we have a new YouTube channel called Optimal State with Amy Wheeler. We also have a new Patreon page where you can support us to bring you the most excellent content, and that is Optimal State and the Yoga Therapy Hour Patreon page. Also, you could write us a review on most major platforms that host podcasts. Give us five stars if you appreciate the show and tell us what you love so that we can do more of that. Finally, we support several nonprofit organizations through this podcast. See the show notes to understand how you can help. If you'd like to be a guest or a sponsor for this program, contact us at the email welcome at theoptimalstate.com. Welcome at theoptimalstate.com. And finally, a special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, 
senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines, Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada, Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria, and Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.